We've got here a little, or what I'm going to say tonight, is some information regarding the OD plan for the past 2,000 years or more. And this is the culmination of years and years of research since I started on the restoration work with Jack O'Day on Dyson Castle. Um, I was always interested in the historic side of it. So, um, yeah, hopefully, uh, by the end of the year, I will have published a book on the, on the early plan. These are only short notes on the, uh, a very, very historic family. So, I will start by uh, waiting a minute so people are a bit better organized by me. But the LDA plan and has no connection with the LDAs should be giving a lecture on the LDAs and researching their history. Uh, this is not unusual in Ireland. In fact, it was always the case that family histories were written by somebody who was not a member of the clan. Uh, this gave more credence to, to the actual histories themselves. Uh, the official historians for the Odays for the past uh, thousand years were in fact the MacBrodies of Rouen. Uh, there are still some families of MacBrodies <coughs> living there. Um, the Odays are one of the luckiest families in Ireland with regard to history. Uh, the reason is that so much of their history survives where others doesn't. And the, uh, probably the reason for that is because not so much the Odeas wrote their own history, which they didn't. In fact, they weren't very good scribes at all. But, uh, <laughs> but so, many other, so many other families and so many other uh, uh, civil servants wrote about the Odeas and what they were up to. That's, uh, there are records all over the place about the Odeas. Um, as well as that, the Odeas are very lucky in that many of their monuments survive for the past uh, o over a thousand years. Uh, in Dysart and the area around Dysart, whereas much of the other families had them leveled. Um, we have to be thankful, of course, to the scribes who wrote in the past about the Odeas. One of the most, uh, the, the, the most important books would be Conrad Hurley, which was written about the year 1360, and was a history of the O'Brien family uh, in the preceding 50 years. But um, because the Odeas were so tied up with the O'Briens in their history and their wars, uh, there was quite a lot of information in that. We must also be grateful to the, to the four masters. Now, the four masters were four Franciscan monks who wrote about history in the 17th century. Uh, they went around the country, they were from Donegal Abbey, and they went around the whole country and collected all the manuscripts from all the different libraries in the castles and wrote them up and had them published in Belgium, in Gaelic, in the year 1634. It was just as well because 16 years later, Cromwell arrived in Ireland. Uh, the Cromwellians, <clears throat> when, they, when they had finally conquered Ireland, they burned thousands and thousands of manuscripts and books. Uh, I don't know why exactly, possibly the fact that because they couldn't read the Gaelic, they may have thought there were books of spells and witches, and many of the Cromwellians were illiterate, of course, and couldn't understand learning, and couldn't understand uh, uh, people writing things down. Uh, but the, the four masters had actually uh, captured most of the history at that stage, so we must be grateful to them. We must also be grateful to the O'Briens, who kept documents for the last 300 years in Dromolan Castle. And about 100 years ago, uh, one of Lord's Intercrane, one of the O'Briens, published the documents he had on hand in 1865, known as the Ancient Queen Manuscripts, and they are available in the National Library in Dublin. So, there are various other documents as well, uh, going back to the early medieval period, uh, mostly written in Gaelic, some written in Latin, some written in both Gaelic and Latin, uh, which give references to the old days. So to these people we must of course be grateful, and I think it's, it shows the importance of actually writing everything down, uh, and uh, it shows the importance of, at this stage of our lives, interviewing people who know stories, and making sure that they are taped and recorded and written down before all this is lost. Um, the, uh, I start off by talking about the importance of genealogy in ancient Ireland. Uh, a, a man or a, a family, their right to their land was of course their genealogy, the importance of their family. If they could prove how noble a line they had and that they were descended from royal forebears, that was their right to land. It wasn't so much a document. Um, and for that reason, the O'Days and every other Gaelic family kept a very, very concise history and genealogy in their families. Uh, this lasted well up into the 17th century. In fact, in the 1690s and early 1700s, uh, members of the Irish Brigade, who were the, the, the brigade of the French army, 
who came from Ireland and fought for the, the King's Louis, uh, they could not become commissioned officers unless they could prove they were from a Gaelic noble family. And so we have to be grateful to, to uh, the sons of Michael O'Day of Dysart, who also kept uh, a very important record of their, of their history and their families. Um, Now, the name O'Day, of course, comes from one member of the family, uh, a man called Day, D -E Father, A G H A I D H, as is as is spelled on the certificate outside. And uh, he lived uh, around the year 960. He was born around the year 900, and died, in fact, died in the year 960 fighting the Vikings. Uh, but the family is much older than than Day himself. It, the old Gaelic name for the tribe was King Al Farmac. And Kinyal Farmic meant the tribe of Farmic, or the family of Farmic. And he lived in the 7th century uh, Farmic. But of course it goes back further than that. And it goes back, they're one of the four, the five Dalcassian families. That's the O'Days, the McNamara's, the O'Briens, and the O'Quins. That's four, I hope I haven't told anyone. And, uh, or Harris, or Harris. Or the O'Harris, that's yeah. right. <laughs> and they were descended from Cus, who was a, a king of Munster in the year uh, 167 AD. Now, when I was researching the history, uh, it had been researched before me, but not, not to any great detail, and they brought the O'Day's back to the 12th century, back to a man called Thad the O'Day, who lived around the year 1150. Uh, when, when I got working on it and managed to translate some of the manuscripts that hadn't been translated before from the Gaelic of the Four Masters, I got back to Day himself, as I say, who was uh, around, died in the year 960. But I continued and continued and continued, and in fact, believe it or not, went back to about the year 800 BC, um, which was Phineas Farsa, a man called Phineas Farsa, king of Syria. And this was before the, the Celts or the Gaels even arrived in Ireland, uh, while they were living in Syria or an area around Turkey. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on the ancient history, but just to, uh, it is interesting. Uh, to, to say how old Irish history is. Now it's only recently it's been proven that in fact this is not on waffle, this is not on legend. There is quite an amount of substance to this. Um, if I can find... Yes, I, I just have a note here on the back of the page. A fascinating article by Richard Warner of the Ulster Museum in volume 4, number 1 of uh, the uh, Irish Archaeology, Archaeology Ireland is the name of the magazine, it came out about four months ago. And he traced these very ancient records back to the year 2000 BC. And uh, he compared them with scientific technology, like dendro chronology, which is the study of wood, and radiocarbon dating. And he managed to find that most of the events uh, mentioned in the very, very ancient histories are in fact quite correct to within 10 or 15 years. Uh, things like plagues, uh, like droughts, like floods that are mentioned in the very ancient histories uh, can be compared uh, with scientific data and become, and, and they are quite correct. So for that reason, I don't take everything in the, in the period before Christ, I don't take everything with a grain of salt. There may in fact be quite a lot of uh, truth in this. Um, the reason I mention Phineas Marsa in the year 700 BC is because the O'Day coat of arms comes from that period, uh, from the period before the Celts arrived in Ireland. Um, it starts off with um, this king of Syria, who the Syrians were of course great archers. We know that from, from the Roman writers, there was a, a legion of Syrians uh, who were famous archers. They were taken on by the pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, in the old Irish records, the pharaoh is known as uh, Pharaoh Antinia. And in other Irish records, the same pharaoh is known as Pharaoh Sinerus. C I N E R U S. Now I I know uh, Egyptologists, and I, I don't know if these people actually existed, but I'm sure somebody here tonight would know where I could get a list of the pharaohs of Egypt. And if I could find out if these people actually existed, we could date this particular reference. Uh, the Syrians were, this, the Syrians uh, fought for the pharaoh as uh, mercenary soldiers, and one of the legends says that one of their jobs was to. Uh, killed the children of Israel when they were under Moses leaving uh, the Holy Land. And one of these, a man called Goliath Das, 
uh, was bitten by a snake. And Moses cured him on the spot. And he told him that uh, the wound would eventually turn green and he would have it for the rest of his life, but that his people would go to a land which was free of reptiles and snakes. <laughs> and since that time, uh, the Odes have had two snakes on their upper third of their coat of arms. <laughs> now, as I say, you can take it with a salt, but I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if that was proven to be true. Uh, they moved again from Syria to Northern Africa to a place called Getulia, G-E-T-U-L-I-A. Now, I'm just reading these out of the ancient Irish manuscripts. I have no idea if such a place exists or if it ever existed, but uh, maybe somebody might know of this. Um, <clears throat> the original day, not the man who gave his name to the family, but the first man with the name D, um, was uh, there about uh, 300 BC. And he was in Spain when the Syrians moved from North Africa into Spain. And he got his name from De Da, which is D E for the G H A T H A, which means uh, of the twin javelins or of the twin spears. Now, some people maintain that the word day is, is uh, something, uh, has some, some meaning to do with God, the Gaelic word God being dia or day, but uh, it looks unlikely, it looks more likely that it's the, the word for two, twin day, and day ga maybe of, of the twin javelins. Uh, his son was a man called Bragan, and uh, supposedly the city of Braganza in Spain is, is to have uh, been built by Bragan, and that's where the name came from. Um, this, this may seem very silly, but remember, we're, this information is taken from manuscripts in the 12th century. Um, so the people who wrote this down have never been to Spain, they've never been to Syria, they've never been to Egypt. But yet, uh, their information um, does have some tie-in with uh, Mediterranean history. Um, now, there are generations and generations of these ideas stretching from, as I say, Phineas Farsa. I thought it was going to be black. <laughs> stretching. Uh, stretching from Phineas Farsa up to uh, uh, this man, Milesius. Now, I, I haven't read them out tonight because there are about 30 generations in there, but in fact. As I say, I haven't read all these, but there is, in fact, a direct line, believe it or not, from Phineas Farsa in 800 BC, a direct line of all the heads of the families, stretching way up through the Irish period, the medieval period, uh, 17th, 18th century, 19th century, up to two families, uh, I hope, that have representatives here tonight. And one family is, of course, the family of Jack and Anola O'Day, and I'll explain later on how we managed to, to finally uh, get that together and the family of Mrs. Maury here, Lucy Casey, who is a, a descendant of Fanny O'Day, the woman who opened a, a hostelry in Lucy Casey in the 1760s. So it, it is unusual that you, you can trace a family directly for nearly 3,000 years uh, without, uh, without a break in the link. Now, as I say, many of these names may be fictitious, but how they could be fictitious, I don't know, because when the O'Days were writing their family history, uh, they were, uh, people were keeping an eye on them. The O'Briens, the McNamaras, the McMahons, everyone was keeping an eye on them. And if they made a mistake, it would be pointed out to them very fast. Because all these other people were tracing their history to the same line. So in fact, it wasn't easy to make a mistake in the histories. Now, <clears throat> writing didn't come into Ireland until after St. Patrick's time in the 6th and 7th centuries. So how did the people remember 2,000 years of history before writing arrived? Well, they had a system, and the system was that uh, their histories were written in poetry and memorized, memorized maybe up to a thousand verses of poetry. And <clears throat> a historian had to spend seven years learning before uh, he was accepted as a historian. And so he would have to learn off thousands and thousands of lines of poetry. But that, that was the easiest way. Once the, the history was written in rhyme, it was much easier to remember than if it were written in prose. Um, we move on then from Braganza, uh, the city of Braganza in Spain, to the next uh, more famous man, a man called Milesius. Now, Milesius is supposed to be, according to Irish history, the, the, the man who brought the Celts to Ireland. Uh, he, was, he was a Celt himself, uh, as I say, from Syria, North Africa, and eventually Spain. And his Gaelic name was Mila Espana, which meant champion of Spain. 
And his Latin name, as he referred to the Latin documents, is Milesius. And the Irish are known as the Milesian clans from that period. Um, he moved back to Syria. Again, they were taken on by the pharaohs as, as uh, mercenaries. And Milesius uh, eventually worked for a pharaoh called Nectonibus. Nectonibus. Now, I don't know again if this pharaoh ever existed, but uh, somebody may put me right on that. And he is supposed to have married the daughter of Pharaoh, who was known as Scota. And she came to Ireland, and eventually the Irish were known as the Scots. The, the Latin name for the Irish is Scoti, which is Scots. Uh, these people moved from Northern Ireland into Scotland in the 6th century AD, and Scotland got its name from that, from the people of Northern Ireland, uh, who they are, they are now known as the Scots and we are known as the Irish. But um, in fact, it, it supposedly in Irish legend, uh, the name Scotland, the Scots, Nova Scotia, all these things that are, uh, with the, the, the word Scot in them are supposed to have come from the daughter of the pharaoh of Egypt, Scota. Um, these people mo moved to Ireland to see what it was like, what the weather was like, and they were beaten by the Bronze Age people who lived here, uh, known as the Tua de Danon, uh, and they went back for reinforcements to Spain. Uh, Milesius had died in the meantime, but Scota and her three sons uh, took an army into Ireland, and she was killed in a battle. Which is not unusual if uh, anyone reads the Julius Caesar's uh, De Bella Gallica, which was a book written about the Celts. The women fought just as bravely as the men. And she is supposed to have Scota in, in South Kerry. Um, they settled in Ireland. They conquered Ireland very quickly because they brought iron, whereas the people before that uh, only had bronze weapons. And uh, they conquered Ireland within four generations. Um, next came Heber. Uh, Heber was the son of Scotland, and he was killed by his brother in a, in a duel uh, later on once Ireland was conquered. And from him, after seven generations, we moved down to Cos, uh, who was king in um, 167 AD. Um, after seven generations again, and the names of these people are listed, um, we come to Farmac, who was uh, king of Munster in the year 550 AD. Now, from that name, we have the, the old Gaelic name for the O.D. clan, which is King Al Farmac, meaning the seed of Farmac. And after eight generations again, it brings us up to uh, the man, the next day in the family, who was the man who gave his surname to the O'Days in the year 960. Now, before we talk to, about day, we must move back slightly and talk about Christianity coming to County Clare. Uh, Christianity came in with St. Patrick in the year 432. Uh, St. Patrick was captured by uh, Irish raiders who used to raid the Roman Empire, and he was the son of a he was the son of a Roman uh, soldier probably, and, and a British wife in, in England, and was captured and brought over here in the year uh, earlier, and came back again as a bishop in the year 432. But he brought Christianity to Ireland, and the Irish took to Christianity in a big way. Um, in fact, it's one of the few countries in the world where there were no martyrs for the faith. The Irish just actually, uh, I would just say, um, uh, embraced, exactly, embraced Christianity very easily. Um, County Clare, one of the earliest saints, or the earliest holy men to bring Christianity to County Clare was a man called Tola. Uh, he was a member of the Galenji tribe who lived in Leash and Offaly, and he came to County Clare around the year 700. And he looked around for a quiet place to say his prayers and decided to deserted place of Tola. And he built a, a church and a monastery in that area. <clears throat> the present monastery of Dysolodi is built on the foundations of Tola's church. And in fact, uh, you would notice by looking at it that the building uh, is of two types. The lower parts of the wall are what we call Cyclopean, which was a very early type of, of building. And that was probably St. Tola's church. And the upper parts of the wall are much more modern masonry or built in the 12th century. Um, by the old days, and uh, it has a very famous doorway, a famous sign cross. It, it's quite famous in its own right. Um, now, the crozier of Saint Tola, uh, which was a wooden staff that he carried, was kept in reverence uh, by the old days for hundreds of years, and I suppose it began to rot about the 12th century, and they decided they have to do something about it. So, like many other uh, Irish towns. They built a uh, silver, they, they made a silver case for it in the shape of a crozier. And they, it, it, 
which could open out and you could take out the wooden closure out of the case and uh, studded it with jewels and, and various precious stones. And that's now in the National Museum. In fact, is one of the items on the Irish, um, I think it's the Irish Treasury uh, exhibit in the National Museum at the moment. It's there side by side with the Dunning of Fan Chalice and the Arda Chalice, St. Tola's closure of Dysel um, About a hundred years ago, uh, some men decided to dig out and excavate the center of their own, sorry, nearly 200 years ago, from the 1780s, decided to dig out the center of their own tower in Dysel to see what was there and they found an old bronze bell, which no doubt was the, the bell of St. Tola. And they gave it to the parish priest in Corifin, who sold it to pay for the present bell in Corifin Church. Uh, we don't know where it went, and it's probably in some private collection, but that would be, uh, they would be the two main uh, early uh, precious items from, from the Dice of the area. Excuse me about. We move, we move on now uh, from St. Tola and uh, the area of the old days. Uh, in fact, to the time of the Viking raids. Now, the round tower was built in Dysart around the year uh, 950 or so. We don't know who built it, but we can only, we can only guess that uh, the chieftain at the time was a man called Day himself. Now, the family took their name from this chieftain, Day. And uh, what is unique is that this is one of the oldest surnames in Europe, O'Day. Not in Ireland, but in Europe. And the reason I say that was uh, Irish surnames became compulsory in the time of Brian Baru. There was so much confusion between people all having the same name, and there were so very few names to go around, that Brian Baru decided they would have to pick one of their uh, great ancestors and call themselves after him, whoever it may be. Uh, so, the O'Days decided they'd, they'd pick Day's name. But he lived before Brian Burrow's time, and in fact, the generation after him called themselves O'Day, which uh, predates Brian Burrow. Uh, now, Ireland have the oldest surnames, in, as we know, in, in, in Europe. We can't say in the world because the Chinese probably have older surnames we have. But um, it's, there's a very good chance that the O'Days are probably the, the oldest uh, people in Europe to have, to have surnames. Uh, the English didn't take on official surnames until the 15th century. Um, the Germans, uh, Swedes, took on surnames in the 13th century. And in fact, uh, quite a lot, of, a lot of other nations in Europe didn't take on surnames until the last century. But the idea that the Irish have been doing it for a thousand years. Now, uh, the reason the name himself comes up in history is because he's, he's one of the people who fought against the Vikings uh, with Brian Burrow's father. Now, Brian Burrow's father was a man called Kineda, uh, from whom the Kennedys, the O'Kennedy Kennedy family, are descended. And uh, he was uh, king of Munster, and he, the king of Munster before him was actually captured by the Vikings at Dundalk. And there is a reference in the manuscripts that he called on the local chiefs to help to rescue Calicon, king of Munster, from the, the Vikings. And the O'Days brought, or Day himself, the chieftain, brought 500 men from Upper Dalgash. Now, Upper Dalgash is the northern area of County Clare or Tormard. So again, it would be the Dice of the Day, the Wang area. 500 men with him in the year 943. And they beat a Viking fleet off Dundalk. And uh, they managed to uh, rescue Calicon, King of Munster. Now, after that period, very little information about the Odeas for the next 50 or 60 years, except one little reference in uh, Anala Locke, the, the Book of Locke, which says that in the year 1056, lightning came and killed three people in Shutala. Or so they must have been living in pieces that made the, the news of the century. Um, after that period, after the period of Brian Baru, uh, Brian Baru defeated the Vikings at Clontarf, but unfortunately Brian Baru himself was killed. And after he was killed, there was no other leader strong enough to take over the Kingdom of Ireland. And so all the various sub-kings were constantly fighting with each other for over a hundred years to try and take over the Kingdom of, of, of Ireland. And the O'Days got involved in this in a big way. Um, they were sub-chiefs to the O'Briens, who were kings of Tormund, and they supported the O'Briens throughout for the next five or six hundred years without fail. And every time the O'Briens got into a, a row or a fight, the O'Days were in beside them. Um, there are a lot of references in the history, uh, as I say, I can't go into them all tonight, but an awful lot of references 
um, to inter tribal wars, wars between the year 1103 and the year 1150, in which numerous of these uh, young men were killed, chieftains, uh, sons of chieftains, were killed in numerous inter tribal war, wars at that period. Now, an interesting thing about wars at that time was um, people attacked each other to show their power. They attacked each other to steal their cattle, cattle, even to steal their slaves. But it never dawned on any of the Irish to take over the land of the land next door. Um, I don't know why this is. I, I'm feeling myself it has to do with if you could prove that you were of noble birth, that you were descended from the ancient Celts who arrived in Ireland, then you were entitled to your land. And even if you were beaten in battle, the land remained yours, but everything you had was probably taken off you. Um, and it wasn't until the Normans came that the Irish were actually shocked that people would take their land. Um, much like, I suppose, like the American Indians, uh, who couldn't realise why people wanted to take over land and why people wanted to run railways through it. Uh, the Irish, it took nearly the Irish uh, nearly a hundred years to get used to the idea of people actually capturing land and taking land off others. Because in all the wars that the other days fought in, uh, for 200 years after the time of Brian Baru, and they were beaten in many of them, they never lost their land or any, or any part of it. Um, the the O'Briens got into a terrible row around the year uh, 1270 when they broke up into two. Uh, Turlock O'Brien, who was the chief of the clan and king of Munster, uh, was opposed by his brother, Brian Rua O'Brien. Uh, this war lasted 45 years. It lasted between uh, 1273 and 1318. And in all this period, the O'Days were involved in, in the fighting. Uh, in fact, when the, the Brian Rua's family were eventually defeated in 1318, uh, some of the O'Days went with him into Tipperary. And that's why you have today, you have, you have two, uh, you could say, two clans of O'Day, one of County Clare and one of Tipperary. Uh, but the Tipperary clan are descended from the O'Days of County Clare. So um, that's another reason why the O'Days are very lucky. If your name was O'Connor or uh, MacDonald, there would probably be three or four different areas, or Kelly, be three or four different areas in the country that you could have come from. If your name was Murphy, there are probably eight different areas in Ireland that you would have come from. But if your name is O'Day, there's no doubt there's only one place you could have come from, and that was Dysart and Rouen area. Um, Monday, May the 17th, 1318, at 4.30pm, the Clare invaded Kingdom Farmick, burned O'Day's town, slaying many. Now, the reason I say all that is because uh, there is a way of checking whether this history is fictitious or whether it's true. Um, they say on Monday, May the 17th, now I know there's a system of working out um, what day May the 17th was in 1311. And uh, I haven't done it. There's a very good chance that it was on a Monday, and if it was, then the records are correct. Um, the clear was a Norman. The Normans arrived in 1169. Uh, they, were, they were brought in by an Irish chief, the Albert MacMurrow, who wanted to get his land back after he was banished from Ireland for, for various crimes and he decided to invite the Normans in. Uh, they took over Ireland, they took over certainly the east of Ireland within a hundred years. They were better equipped, uh, they had uh, better strategy than the Irish, who fought in a very old-fashioned way. And by the year 1270, they had moved in very much into County Clare. They built Bunratty Castle, they built uh, Clare Castle. They'd taken over all the eastern side of County Clare, and now they were heading for the west. Um, they moved into Dysart, as I say, in the year 1318, and uh, ravaged the countryside and burned the town of Dysart. Now that's the first reference in the manuscripts to Dysart as a town, as a, as a settlement in the year 1311. Um, naturally, Odi I was very worried about this, no doubt, I wanted to get his own back. And so he joined, again, he joined O'Brien trying to rout the Normans. They fought the Normans again in North Clare in, at the Cistercian Abbey of Corkham Row in 1317, and uh, they moved the songs outside Corkham Row Abbey. Uh, the, the ruins of Corkham Row are still there and very impressive near Valley Vahan in County Clare. So things were not looking good for the O'Days or the O'Briens. And things came to a hit when on the 10th of May 1318, uh, the Clare moved against O'Day himself at Dysart. Uh, he came across from Rouen, and as some of you who know the geography of the county will know that Rouen is due east of Dysart O'Day. He came across uh, from Rouen on the morning of the 3rd of 
the third of May, with about 600 horse and 3,000 foot soldiers uh, against Odi. Now, Odi wasn't prepared for this attack at all, but um, they uh, ambushed it there at a small uh, forward over a stream at Mackin Bridge. Mackin Bridge is still there. The site of the battle is still well known. And uh, the clear rushed across against the Odis with his knights and left his main army behind. And uh, he was ambushed by the Odis and he was killed immediately. Uh, he was one of the first people to be killed in the battle. Uh, after that, uh, the, the main body of the soldiers came across and fought against the Odis and got the better of the Odis. Uh, that evening, as the Odis were nearly finally uh, defeated, the O'Hares, the O'Connors and the O'Lochtons came down from North Clare and joined in in the fight. But again, the things were going very badly for O'Day when O'Brien and his troops who were uh, stationed near Spencer Hill in Crescene uh, heard about and according to the manuscripts they dropped their armour uh, and everything heavy and uh, moved with their light weapons uh, towards Dyson as fast as they possibly could and eventually with the help of the Odis, the McNamara's, the O'Briens, they very decisively beat De Clare and his army, uh, who, who was in the command of De Clare's son at the time, Thomas De Clare. Uh, in that battle were killed 80 young noblemen, or knights' sons, uh, eight uh, English knights, uh, among them were Sir, Sir Henry Cabell, Sir Thomas de Nace, Sir James Conton, Sir John Conton, his brother, Sir Adam Appleyard. Uh, these were all killed by the, the Irish and the English army was totally defeated. Um, the Clare himself was so hated by the Odeas after what he done in 1311 that his body was actually hacked to pieces. But uh, the monks from the Franciscan Abbey in Ennis uh, came out and uh, picked up the bits and put it in the box and sent it into Limerick. And he was buried in the Franciscan Abbey in Limerick. Um, excuse me, what? After this period, things are fairly quiet. There are no more English or Norman incursions into County Clare, in fact, for nearly 200 years. And uh, most historians will say that that is because of the defeat of Dice uh, That evening, after the battle, uh, the Irish moved down to Bunratty, which was the Clare's stronghold, uh, to capture Bunratty, to find it in flames. Mrs. De Clare had packed all her belongings into a boat and set fire to Bunratty. So there was nothing left. I don't think they were too worried. So that, that it, it brings on a period of peace which lasted for nearly 200 years after that, um, up to the, the 16th century. And uh, during that period of peace, uh, much progress was made in County Clare. It became the golden age of Irish building and certainly the golden age of County Clare building. Uh, numerous abbeys were built, Franciscan abbeys, Cistercian abbeys, uh, Augustinian abbeys were built during that time by the Irish chieftains. Um, numerous castles, in fact we just <coughs> finished a survey of tower houses about uh, a year ago, uh, where 210 castles were built in County Clare by the Irish chieftains between the years 1450 and 1550. And uh, <coughs> most of these sites can still be identified, although many of the castles have been taken down and used for building stones, for building stone. Uh, the next major reference to the old days after that period would be the year 1395. Now, the Black Death came in uh, 1348 to Ireland. It came across Europe, caused mainly by rats, and thousands of people died. And it came to Ireland in the year 1348. Um, mostly the Normans and the English suffered. The reason for that was because they lived in uh, castles, tower houses, and cities, and places that were uh, uh, not very clean and uh, certainly not very hygienic, whereas the Irish themselves like to live outdoors uh, live out in the countryside, in the fresh air and fresh water. So uh, the Norman population was, was reduced by nearly two-thirds uh, during the, the Black Death, and that, uh, to a great extent, took away the threat of, of uh, more uh, Norman warfare. So we move on to 1395. The year 1395, uh, Richard II, King of England, came to Ireland to try and uh, reconquer Ireland for, for England. Uh, he didn't uh, fare very well at that, but he did send around the Earl of Nottingham around to uh, get the Irish chiefs to submit. 
And uh, I'd like to see them here days. Uh, took the sensible option there and submitted in the year 1395. And they submitted to him at a place called Ma Ayer, which is about six miles from here, the inauguration place of the O'Briens. Uh, on the 14th of March 1395, and the chief of the O'Days there was Rory O'Day of Dyson, who submitted. But of course, as soon as um, Richard II had returned to England, he was ignored, and everybody returned to their own daily way of life. Um, the next the thing that happens there is the building of the castles and tower houses. And uh, the Irish, who usually lived in stone forests, which were big round forests with numerous houses inside, were forced uh, to build tower houses and castles because now they could see the threat of invasion from England or from other uh, greedy barons living around the place, either Irish or English or Norman. And uh, they built uh, more or less the same plan. And what surprises me sometimes is the fact how identical these houses nearly were, as if one architect had designed all the houses. Um, the tower house is, is very typical of plan, and I've seen hundreds of them in this county, and with very few changes. They're nearly all less six stories high, uh, with the small rooms, uh, four stories with the large chambers. Uh, they nearly always have <coughs> a staircase on the left-hand side as you go in the door. And uh, as if the same architect designed each one of them, uh, the O'Day has built six tower houses, uh, one of which is only standing now. I hope I'm right, no, sorry, five tower houses. Uh, they built the one at Dyson O'Day, which is restored and the only one, the only one in They built one at Bandalika, which I only found about three months ago. Um, I had come across in the history numerous references to the O'Day's of Bandalika Castle. And uh, a few months ago, a friend of mine and myself went out to find Bandalika Castle. Um, we went to an old man who said yes, he knew where it was, it was on Pat O'Brien's land in Ryan. So we went to Pat O'Brien to know where it was Pat O'Brien's castle. And he showed me uh, a big square of uh, <coughs> foundation or masonry very close to his house. To, uh, sorry, is this microphone an eye view? Yeah. Hey, can you hear all right? Yeah, yeah, perfect. <coughs> uh, and I said, have you any evidence that this was a castle? He said, well, there's a few stones maybe that might show that it was a castle. And there, the only stone that actually shows that the Lickey Castle was one of the door hangers, one of the rounded stones where the hinges of the door were sitting, and he had set the concrete to top of his gatepost. And that, that is the last piece of evidence of the famous castle of the Lickey of your days. Even a better one was the castle of my Holland, which is up on the hill over the Iceland, about two miles distant. And I went up to my home to try and find the, the remains of the castle there. Mr. John Lester was up there, <coughs> showed me what he thought was the size of my home. Uh, there was nothing at all except, again, a square platform on the ground. And some stones built into the field walls, which might have been uh, parts of the corner stones of the castle. And uh, about a month later, when he rang me up on the phone, he was after repairing his house, and he took down his fireplace. And out of the fireplace, he took the, uh, the top of the window of, of my own castle with two heads carved into it. And he gave it to me, which I have up in Dyson on display now. And that's the last remaining stone of my own castle. Uh, McGowan and Castle was another one which fell. And uh, very little remains of McGowan now, save, save one wall. And of course, Benny Griffey Castle, which was originally built by your days, but later led to uh, <coughs> the O'Griffies, who were uh, re relations of the O'Days, the Griffin family, or the O'Griffies. And that's only about four miles outside of this near John Cliff graveyard. If any of you get a chance to see it, you can actually, if you're any good at climbing, you can actually go up onto the roof and, and walk around the roof of Benny Griffey Castle. So those were the five houses of the old days, and Dyson was the headquarters. And there were ten, <coughs> ten tower houses built in the parish of Dyson itself. Um, only, as I say, only five of these old days. The others were built by O'Hogan's, who were the, the neighboring family, and the O'Brien's. Uh, the O'Brien's didn't own any particular land in Dyson, but they liked to keep an eye on everyone else. So they always built the castle in everyone else's land. <laughs> <coughs> so the O'Brien castles are spread throughout the whole county. Um, excuse me a moment. I hope that will do not watch me. <laughs> um, <coughs> I, I know some of this information may be quite boring, uh, going on through history and history and history, but uh, the fact of the matter is, these are only notes from a from, uh, uh, very large uh, uh, book on the, the old days, uh, which I'm uh, trying to 
as far as possible if you have a feeling for the for a very ancient history, which goes back a long, long way. We move now into uh, the 15th century and the building of the castle by our friend uh, Pierre Bedotti around the year 1480. So we can't be exactly uh, exactly sure when it was built. But, uh, we have a, a few references in the English state papers to Pierre Bedotti, and in fact we have a lease of the castle from 1567 which uh, is, goes into three pages and is very specific as to how the lease is to be maintained and states that Diogo de was the great-grandfather of the present leaseholder and again that brings us back quite a bit to the, the 1480s. Um, the, I, I won't go into any great detail, detail describing the castle or describing uh, the history of this because I intend to do that tomorrow morning when we're actually on the spot. But uh, to, just uh, to go on about some of the things that might have happened. Gerald O'Day had built the castle. Uh, in 1570, he had an argument with the Lord Deputy here in County Clare. The Lord Deputy, who was the King's representative in Ireland, wanted to put a sheriff in each county, and the sheriff was to keep an eye on the Irish, basically. Uh, O'Brien refused, uh, and O'Day, of course, after, probably after a few pints, lost his temper, and got into serious trouble with, with the Lord Deputy, who actually um, besieged the castle in 1570 and took it off to O'Day's. I'm sure after uh, an apology, the O'Day has got it back again. But um, managed to lose it again uh, numerous times, not through war, but in fact through mortgaging and remortgaging property. Now so that's a thing that comes up an awful lot in the O'Day's history. Um, <laughs> there are lists and lists of people who, uh, whom D Dyson was mortgaged to. <laughs> and I suppose uh, a lot of the early people in the old days, they decided if they wanted money fast, uh, the easiest way was to mortgage the house. Uh, and it wasn't easy of course to get the castle back if, people, if, 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 if the money wasn't redeemed. And so it was besieged and besieged other times. People had to apply to the Bishop of Kildare, the Bishop of Killaloo, uh, the Lord Deputy, the High Sheriff, uh, to try and get their money back from the old days, which wasn't easy. <laughs> but, um, all the way up from the from about the year 1570, all the way up to the year 1640, uh, you have different people living in the in, in Dyson Castle. You have people by the name of Cahill, uh, Carrie, uh, Neelands. Neelands moved in and out every ten years, and, and those days. And um, that brings us on to another very famous character, a woman called Mara Lou O'Brien, who is one of the most famous characters of the uh, 17th century county Clare legend. Now, Daniel Neelan, uh, who was uh, uh, an officer in the Irish Army at the time, Daniel Neelan had the castle mortgage to him for £300. Uh, now, that wouldn't be just a castle, that would be a castle and maybe a thousand acres of land in the area. Uh, the mortgage was never redeemed, and Daniel Neelan and his friends uh, managed to besiege castle and, and take it over. So he moved in, bag and baggage, into Dysart and moved out to your days. Uh, for some reason or other, they didn't mind too much. Because you find on all the Neelands' wills and documents, the O'Days are wit witnesses and executors. <laughs> and you find on the O'Days' wills and documents, the Neelands are witnesses and executors. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the relationship was between the Neelands and the O'Days, but it, it, it was quite amicable, nevertheless. Um, William Neelan, who was Daniel's son, married uh, a girl of the McMahons in uh, the year 1620. And she was Mara Rowan McMahon and uh, they moved into Dysart and they had three children there and they lived for five years and then William died. Excuse me. And uh, she had remarried Conor O'Brien uh, of another castle up in uh, Lemina. And even though it was a tower house just like Dysart, she must have been looking at London catalogues or something, she decided to build a better and bigger house. And she built the present castle of Lemina, which is a big rambling Tudor mansion which we will see on Sunday. Um, just after she had a bit, the Cromwellians arrived, and the war started again, and her husband was killed. And she, in order to save her lands from the Cromwellians, got on her finery and her carriage and her horses and uh, galloped into Limerick as fast as she could. And she offered to marry the first English officer who would approach her. And uh, a man called John Cooper stepped forward, and they were married. Uh, they were married within a week, in fact, of her husband being shot by the Cromwellians on her brain. And uh, because of that, 
uh, she managed to keep her legs for the O'Briens until the present day, believe it or not. The present Lord in Chibre, Conor O'Brien, uh, still lives uh, on O'Brien lands in New Market County there, all because of the good sense of Marlon Lua, my man, <laughs> well, in the 1640s. Now, there was a legend for years and years and years that Marlon Lua uh, killed John Cooper by having the servants throw him out the window when he was shaving. <laughs> but uh, after some research, I discovered that, in fact, 30 years after he was supposed to be killed, he had set up an auctioneering firm here in Ellis. <laughs> and was buying and selling land throughout the county in 1720. So, in fact, she may not have been as cruel as, as, as is thought. But uh, she was one of the, the characters of the next 30 years, I suppose. Um, we move in then to the 16 before Maru finished up. The Brown William period of the, the 1650s. Now, the Irish. In, in 1649, because of the English Civil War and the war between Cromwell and Charles I, the Irish decided to take advantage of the situation and try and recapture back as much land from the English as they could. Um, Charles II promised them uh, certain graces. He promised them religious freedom and he promised them uh, that they would have proper title to their own land. Their own titles were in Gaelic, these were not recognized by the English, but he, proper, he, he promised them English title if they'd given 120,000 pounds. So the Irish chieftains collected 30,000 pounds and sent it over to Charles II. And uh, uh, nothing happened. They got no graces, they got no religious freedom. So uh, the O'Briens decided to collect an army, to gather an army to fight for Charles II in England. And they gathered that army from County Clare and some of the others fought in England in the Battle of Edge Hill against the Crown Islands in, uh, I think it was 1643. Uh, meanwhile, back in Ireland, the Irish decided to take over English houses, uh, capture English arms, just in case a war did start. And the O'Days were very much involved in this. Now, uh, kind of a funny incident happened outside Ennis. Uh, about two miles outside Ennis is the, is the lake of Ballyella. And in Ballyella Lake, uh, one castle, uh, Ballyella Castle, was owned by an English uh, merchant here in Ennis, a man called Morris Cuff. And uh, when the English realized that the Irish were going to take over land, they all decided to get into Ballyanna Castle and uh, uh, bolt the doors and not come out until reinforcements arrived from England. So the Irish decided to besiege Ballyanna Castle. Now, it's, uh, it's amazing to read the accounts of the siege of Ballyanna Castle. Number one was Morris Cuff recognized all the Irish outside who were besieging because they all owed him money for the shop. <laughs> and he wrote this and this of the Irish, and among them were Conor Crone O'Day of Dyson O'Day. Um, this siege didn't, didn't, didn't last very long. Uh, the Irish made numerous attempts to capture the castle, uh, failing. They even at one stage threatened to bring a, a heavy artillery piece from Limerick, but the roads were so bad they couldn't get up, and the English realized that they couldn't get it up. So the Irish um, built a wooden gun and painted it black and brought it up in front of Ballyanna Castle and threatened to blow up Ballyanna Castle if the English wouldn't surrender, but of course they, they realized it was only a wooden gun. And uh, the, the, the accounts are, are very, very uh, humorous. In one, one case, the English couldn't get water into the castle and used to throw a bucket on a rope down into the lake. And the Irish then used to see how many holes they could put in the bucket while they had them. But eventually the siege ended quite amicably. Uh, the English surrendered and in fact returned to their houses in, in County Clare, which were not taken by the Irish. But um, in 1650, Cromwell arrived in County Clare and uh, did serious damage, and it, it is hated in some areas still for, for the amount of uh, ravaging, pillaging, and various other assault and misdemeanors he committed uh, while being in County Clare. One of the things he did was he uh, slighted all the tower houses, and that meant he knocked down all the stairs and knocked off the battlements. Uh, he, his soldiers were stationed in Dyson Castle for 10 months in 1651 and did numerous, uh, uh, did a lot of damage to, to the castle while they were, they were stationed there. And that's the main reason for it falling into ruin after that period. Um, after the restoration in 1660, uh, the O'Days got their lands back from, from the Cromwell and soldiers who had taken it over. And uh, they held their lands until 1689. In 1689, the, as we refer to it now, the First World War started. You had uh, the Protestants versus the Catholics. Uh, on the Protestant side, you had the 
English, the Germans, the Danes, and the Scandinavians, the Swedes mostly. And on the Catholic side, you had the English, again, English Catholics, and you had the French, and you had the Irish. And this war lasted from 1689 to 1691, in which the Irish Catholics were defeated at Limerick in 1691. Um, the, an offer was made to them that they could, uh, they would not suffer for the war of 1691 if they marched out with their full kit, drums and guns, and uh, awaited. They had a, a choice, three choices. One choice was to join the British Army, one choice was to join the French Army, and the other choice was to return home, lay down their weapons and return to their own houses. Uh, out of 11,000 uh, soldiers in the in 1691, uh, 1,000 joined the English Army, 1,000 returned home, laid down their arms, and 9,000 decided to fight for King Louis of France and set up the Irish Brigade. Now, the O'Days were very much instrumental in, in the Irish Brigade from the earlier period. Um, Michael O'Day, who was chieftain in 1689-1690, was ordered by King James uh, to supply a company of soldiers to, to the army of King James to fight against the Protestants. Uh, he refused to do so, I suppose, having good sense, um, decided he, he, would, he would opt for peace. But he got a further letter stating that if he didn't uh, supply 30 horses to the army of King James, uh, that his land and his house would be taken from him. So he supplied 30 horses to uh, Lord Dillon's regiment, and for that reason, after the siege of Limerick, he lost all his land. Um, his two sons, uh, I think it was James and Michael again, became officers in the French army, in the Irish Brigade, and uh, moved, out, moved out to France. Um, after that period, 1691 or so, the ODs become very scattered. What is interesting is that the two main census uh, during the late Middle Ages, uh, one was the 1641 census, which is known as the Pity, or, uh, the Pity Census, uh, was to uh, name all the landowners in County Clare in 1641. And practically all the O'Days, uh, bar two, I think, are in Dysart and Rouen. Now, you move on then to the 1851 census, which is the Griffiths valuation, and there was only one O'Day living in Dyson and Rouen, and he is Timothy O'Day, who was a land labourer and didn't own any land whatsoever. And now, if you take another area of County Clare, Kilmittal, which is out, uh, out in halfway between here and Kilrush, and you take the 1641 census, there's no O'Day whatsoever mentioned. But if you take the 1851 census, there's over 200 O'Day families on land in Kilmittal. So all the evidence seems to suggest that after 1691 and the, the defeat of the Williamite Wars, uh, the O'Days lost their lands totally in the Dyson Rouen area and bought land in a uh, uh, less fertile area in Kilmail area. From there, because of the famine, they moved out to Australia, the United States, uh, Britain, and uh, here we are today, 300 years later. So that is more or less that. Thank you very much. Uh, a Protestant family of Sings moved in. They are quite famous in their own right, and in fact their history is on videotape, and we hope to see it in the castle tomorrow, the O'Days and the Sings. But uh, about 1920, the Sings became a uh, member of the encumbered estates, which meant they, they could no longer hold on to their vast estates, and uh, the land commission divided up the land. And the land went to local farmers, and of course if there were any archaeological monuments or abbeys or churches or castles on the land, then the local farmer got it as part of his plot of land. Um, that, that was the way it remained until 1970, when John and Nola were travelling through Ireland, and uh, just they knew they were Irish, and they knew they were of Irish descent, and he came across a signpost which said, uh, Dice of Castle. And he drove up the road and then he reversed back and he said, could that possibly be O'D, O'D? And went up to it and found out that the castle was for sale and went to the auction and bid against uh, an American millionaire, am I right? Uh, Jack. 68, 1968. And purchased the castle. And of course, if it wasn't for Jack, there'd be none of us here today. Uh, I got involved because I lived there beside the castle. Um, I bought a cottage there about 10 years ago and uh, I was always involved in building. And I was about in archaeology and I was about in history and the three of them came together and I got talking to Jack and uh, he asked me would I, would I, while he was gone away from Ireland for the winter, would I carry out some repairs in the castle, which I did. And uh, after a few years, uh, we decided it might be a good idea if, if the castle was totally uh, refurbished and totally restored 
and I went to Jack with an idea that if he um, gave us a lease on the property, we would restore it. Um, by we, I mean the local development association, all the people living in Dysart, and uh, we, with Jack's help, of course, and ourselves, we managed to finance the restoration. It was mostly voluntary work, mostly people working after five o'clock in the evening, up to the midnight, with lights hanging all over the place, Saturdays and Sundays. And uh, after three years' work, uh, not three full years, but three six-month periods during the winter, we managed to uh, finish the building and to uh, open it up as a museum, which we have now. So uh, it's uh, mainly thanks to, thanks to Jack, Jack's good foresight and seeing a signpost. Other than that, we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> That's how I got about. I've got another question. Right. Really? And uh, we didn't have any.